and welcome to COVID-19, Your Questions Answered, a webinar series addressing your most pressing questions about the coronavirus pandemic. My name is Chris Wenger. I'm a director here at First Service Residential, and I'll be moderating today's webinar. Joining me today, we have Catherine Efron. She's a regional director for our high-rise division at First Service Residential. Welcome, Catherine. Thank you. Um, we have Laura Manning, who's an attorney with Siegfried Rivera. Um, good morning. Good morning. And we have Rick Slifer, board president uh, for the Landmark at the Gardens. So welcome, Rick, and thank you for being here. Thank you. As North America's property management leader, First Service Residential recognizes the growing concerns over the coronavirus outbreak and its impact that it's been having on the community as well as your associations. We've shared valuable insight for navigating this uncharted territory in our comprehensive 90-minute webinar, Navigating Coronavirus Crisis in Your Community. And the response to this was unprecedented. We got an overwhelmingly positive response with lots of questions. In the weeks since, we've had hundreds of questions from property management professionals and board members just like you on a variety of different topics, specifically around access control, cleaning protocols, amenity usage, financial considerations, and reporting procedures. Over the next few weeks, we'll tackle these topics, offering guidance, sharing practices, and providing practical information to help you navigate these unprecedented times. Today, we'll be answering your questions about how to implement access control protocols during this pandemic. Whether you live in a high-rise community, garden style, or an HOA, this will be valuable information you can take back to your association. I think it's important to note we'll be discussing and addressing a lot of short-term problems and solutions, uh, but boards would be really wise to consider the long-term implications as well. Uh, the, we don't know how long this pandemic's going to go along, unfortunately, and things are changing on a daily basis, so keep that in mind. Um, also keep in mind, these uh, we'll be talking to Florida representatives today, um, like Laura, uh, who's licensed in Florida and um, specifically for uh, you know the state of Florida. So therefore, if you are in another state, keep those in mind and, and definitely uh, refer back to your attorney's control. Uh, with the recent shelter-in-place orders, does our association have the right to restrict access to the following visitors? So the first one that I think is, is really important that's come up a lot is friends and family. And I'm going to send this over to Laura first and see how, um, what recommendations you have for associations. Hi, good morning. So in Florida, um, and probably your state as well, um, our governor and our local municipalities have entered safer in place orders. And in those safer in place orders, the governor and mayors and of local municipalities have listed what they consider essential versus non-essential services. Um, so basically everybody's been ordered to shelter in place and only those um, persons who are considered essential service providers or essential services should be the ones who are moving about in the community. So in Florida, we also have um, emergency powers that associations have been enabled to enact under 718.1265 and 720.316 of the Florida statutes. So between the powers that are provided to the association boards of directors under those Emergency Powers Act in the Florida statutes that allow them to restrict certain access to certain areas of a community association, coupled with these lists that we've received from, that are, that are you know, contained within these executive orders and emergency orders that our local governments have enacted, um, what we've found with friends and family is that unfortunately they are not a part of or on the list of what is considered essential um, service providers. So unless they are friends and family who are coming to assist an elderly person or a disabled individual, an association would be within its power. And remember those powers are, are always must be reasonable, right? Everything has to be reasonable in order to protect the health, safety, and welfare of, of the residents and the building, it, it would be reasonable to restrict access to the building to friends and family. 
Okay, great. Thank you, Laura. Uh, Kat, in your buildings, how are you handling this? Thanks, Chris. And it's a pleasure to be here today with everybody. Our boards of directors, whether they're boards of homeowners associations or condominiums, have been faced with a lot of difficult decisions lately. We're all following the operational guidelines that First Service has put out as a tool or a resource for our boards to make decisions with their attorneys. We're also following CDC guidelines, um, governmental and municipal orders. Our boards understand that they have a fiduciary duty. Um, they are concerned about the safety and welfare of their residents, understandably. Their challenge is with short-term planning and long-term implementation. So that's where we're at a few months into this. We've all been working closely with association council, insurance agents, um, and we do hope that everybody who is watching today, uh, participating and taking part in this webinar, we wish the best of health to you and your families. Because friends and family love to gather, whether it be in clubhouses in a homeowners association or a high rise condominium, mid rise townhomes, we are familial people. We love to gather, we love to get together and celebrate. So this has been especially challenging for management and the boards. Um, many condominiums we are seeing now, they're limiting guests and visitors. Some have eliminated that for the safety of everybody. Um, we're also having to conserve cleaning supplies. So the less people coming and going, touching the elevator buttons and the handles of, of building elements uses more cleaning supplies. Um, our residents have been very supportive of the boards. We found that uh, they have embraced um, the board's decisions. Of course, the boards have had to enact their emergency powers with association council guiding them. But so far, um, we understand that this is just part of our life right now. It will not be forever. We will hopefully transition out of it soon. Yeah, hopefully. Thank you, Kat. And Rick, how have your residents been handling this? And, and how is your association doing with this visitor uh, friends and family policy? Uh, well, we we started off with the premise that uh, our our residents would want substantiation for everything we, that we did. So we start off with a set of objectives of health and safety and welfare of our residents. Uh, and we try to make our decisions with a balance in, in the short run reaction to immediate uh, needs and longer term goals of, you know, the, the prospects of this being the new normal. Uh, we've, we've sought legal uh, guidance from uh, uh, Laura Manning, our attorney, uh, and we have sought operational guidance from First Services, uh, our general manager on site, and in talking with uh, at her management and her experts. Um, any document we put out to the unit owners has had a legal review and is substantiated by the pro proper legal uh, citations. Uh, and um, and we also follow state and county uh, emergency initiatives, but we listen very closely to what the experts are saying as well. We recognize that often the political process lags, uh, what the scientists are telling us is what's best to do. And we've, we've been maybe early on some things, but it always proved out within a day or so to be the direction given by the, our political leaders. Uh, different states have different sense, different, uh, uh, senses of urgency, but we found that with friends and family and speaking directly to our residents, uh, asking them to restrict guests, uh, asking them to register the visitors that are necessary for their daily lives, like health workers, and we'll talk about a little bit more about that later, uh, and also being considerate of the fact that if somebody has the virus or somebody is concerned or somebody has a, another condition, 40% of our owners or our residents are seniors, uh, a family member coming to visit mom or dad or both uh, is pretty important to their 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 well-being and their stress levels. So we we are are uh, we've discouraged uh, visits from friends, um, and we'll talk about a little bit later about screening. And we but we have at, and urged res residents to register their family members that might come on a regular basis to bring lunch or to help them with their medications or pick them up for a doctor's appointment and things like that. So we're trying to be flexible, but at the same time, cut down the number of people who 
quite frankly, we don't know where the heck they've been and uh, what they've done and what they've touched. And uh, it's that's a challenging task to uh, screen everybody properly. Absolutely. Um, yeah, and we, I'm yeah, we, we have three high rise towers, so we have a big amount of mm -hmm. geography to worry about when it comes to friends and family and how they wander around the building. So we'll get to more of that later. Yeah, great. And I'm, I'm glad you brought up the friends and family bringing over or family bringing over food and, and medication, because that kind of brings us into our next topic of uh, people delivering food, uh, you know, and this is not family or friends that are coming over. These are delivery packages as well as food delivery. So, uh, Laura, what are you advising your associations um, to do with these uh, deliveries? So food delivery and package delivery are considered essential services. I have counseled my clients to put in place um, restrictions on access to the building or basically access to the units. Um, a lot of my clients I know have um, uh, basically stopped deliveries up to individual units except in certain circumstances. Um, food deliveries, they're requiring owners or residents to come down to the lobby to pick up food and or packages. For larger condominiums, um, their packages, and I think um, Catherine can talk more to this, you know, I know for larger condominiums, all of their packages are stored in their certain storage areas or they're delivered and, and they're having to disinfect um, downstairs after delivery. Um, but basically just keeping, you know, we're trying to stop the flow of people into the building and up into the units. Um, and so, be, but, but, you know, with the understanding that food delivery, package delivery are considered essential services. So we've, they're necessary to this to this process. Great, and Kat, on an on-site level, how are uh, your associates handling this? So deliveries and packages are handling handled a little bit differently in homeowners associations, of course, uh, that have guard gates and gate access than perhaps in a high-rise condominium where there's a front desk. Uh, with respect to high-rise condominiums. Uh, most of our associations are not permitting the packages to go up to the unit, nor the food delivery. So if we take um, deliveries first. So the residents will come down to pick up their food delivery, unless let's say somebody is not well, if they're not feeling well, they can notify management and we'll be happy to bring their, um, their food up to them. If it's a family caretaker who's delivering food, um, we can do the same thing. Um, with respect to packages, I uh, want to make a distinction between disinfecting and sterilizing. They're two very different things. We do encourage associations to, before they implement processes such as this, to consult with insurance uh, agents and counsel. But Many associations are taking the boxes and spraying them down with a disinfectant. Uh, most packages, you know, come in the bubble wrap pack or cardboard, and we are concerned, many people are concerned that the virus might live for a considerable number of hours on cardboard. That being said, the residents are opting to come down. There might be a table in the lobby or even outside under the porte cochet uh, near the valet area in a high-rise condominium. They'll bring their own bag. The contents they will remove from the box and put in their bag and take to their unit, and then we will dispose of the box. That's how uh, some of the uh, condominiums are handling that. Yeah, that's, that's a really great recommendation, Kat. Thank you. And uh, Rick, is there anything um, different that your community is doing or anything you want to add to that? Um, we, we have all food delivered to the lobby, period. Okay, it doesn't matter if it's dinners or, or groceries from uh, Publix or, or whatever, it's delivered to the lobby. And we have two tables set up for that and people are notified immediately. And, and if it's perishables, they're down there right away. If it's something else, they may leave it there for a little bit, but most of the time those tables are empty because they're picked up right away. Package delivery, uh, to Kat's point, uh, we, we have all the packages delivered to a, a package room. Uh, and when they're, before they're shelved to the proper apartment number, they're recorded in a log. Uh, they are sprayed with a mixture of a, a very weak uh, uh, 
uh, bleach mixture uh, that you know kills surface stuff. It's not wouldn't be a sterilization type of thing. And uh, and then people were notified to come and pick up their packages. So we have carts available which have been sanitized for them to do that. It's very important to remember to to wipe down those carts frequently. Uh, the other side of the coin is if somebody were ill and had notified uh, First Services General Manager on site that they were the health department had had told them they needed to quarantine for a period of time while they were recovering from the disease. These would be people tested positive. Uh, we have protocols in place that were written by First Services Corporation uh, for um, maintaining, monitoring their their uh, 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 their not their not not. Um, we don't have cameras on them, but we, we, we monitor their progress. Uh, we make sure that they understand the rules that they're not to come out into the building for any reason, uh, except maybe to go to the doctors or what have you. And then we'll take the necessary precautions and clean up behind them, things like that. We deliver their packages. We deliver their food. We deliver their prescriptions. And we do it with a system of calling them, coming up, knocking, leaving it on the floor, and then skedaddling out of there. Uh, until they pick it up. We also go up when they ask to uh, to pick up their trash. We have nobody now that's in quarantine uh, for the virus. We only have people that have self-quarantined themselves as a part of their social distancing. So we haven't had to use these uh, techniques yet, but we have them in place. And that's a key thing for uh, board members to know. Uh, don't wait until something happens before you put one of these things in place. Have a plan. Make sure you have agreement with your first services manager and other board members and your key influencers that, that this is a good thing to put in place now before you have two or three of these things going on and you need to add it. Uh, get your legal reviews done. Write it up. Let everybody know. Socialize it, what have you. But it's, it's key to the success and the buy-in on the program. Absolutely. Thank you, Rick. I think those are good best practices and absolutely planning is, is the key here. Um, so going on to the next category, housekeepers and healthcare providers or caretakers. Um, again, I'll go to Laura on this. Uh, what are you advising? So again, housekeepers have been one of those issues that um, in the beginning was sort of hotly contested. And, you know, because a lot of people rely on their housekeepers to come in, you know, once a week, every other week to, to help them keep their place clean. However, again, I go back to my safer at home orders and my lists from the government of what is or are or are not considered essential services and housekeepers are not considered essential services. Um, the thought being, I am sure on the governmental level, because I know it was from, you know, our level when we were talking with our clients, you know, housekeepers could have been in any number of apartments or houses on any given day before they enter, before they come into the building. So um, unless, again, unless there is a housekeeper coming to take care of an elderly person or a disabled individual who cannot clean up their own house um, and who, you know, who doesn't have the ability to clean up their own house, they are, they would be, an association would be it would be a reasonable rule for them to prohibit access to housekeepers. Healthcare providers and caretakers are on the list of what are considered essential service providers. Um, I think that one is a speaks for itself kind of um, position as a service provider, a healthcare provider, a caretaker, especially for the elderly or disabled. The association, while they can, while they must, you know, allow access to those people, I think that they can. Um, place restrictions on how those people must carry themselves while they're on the common areas, whether it's um, wearing personal protective equipment, um, face coverings, gloves, et cetera, when they're on property. But housekeepers, non-essential, healthcare providers, essential. Understood. Um, so Kat, how have you been enforcing this on your properties and um, is there anything that you're doing differently? And, and it's important to make a distinction in a homeowner's association, perhaps if they're single family homes, that maid or housekeeper might only be going to that home. And in that case, that's their individual choice. But in a condominium setting where there's shared common elements, that person is going through the common areas to get to the unit. And it, it, that is part of the reason they're not considered essential. However, 
with a caveat, if someone is ill, we would have to have a discussion on a case-by-case -case basis because if somebody is not feeling well and they cannot clean their own unit or their own apartment, in that case, they might need help so that they're in a more sanitary environment. Um, with essential personnel, of course, physical therapists, doctors, veterinarians, nurses, nurses' aides, they are essential and they would be permitted in. Um, of course, wearing masks and gloves, uh, face coverings. Um, uh, let's also make a distinction that for service residential, uh, building housekeeping and janitorial are considered essential because we are there cleaning the common areas um, to keep that uh, safe for the residents. Um, so a maid might be exempt if they're coming to clean for somebody who is not well. I also just want to add one item onto the conversation about deliveries. Again, with respect to safety and health. Of course, we're not permitting deliveries perhaps of sofas and couches, but if it is a refrigerator, washer dryer, or a stove, an oven, somebody does need to have cold bread, milk, or eggs, um, that type of delivery would be allowed. Great, yeah, I think that's a good distinction to make. Thank you. Um, and going on to contractors, I know this has been a hot topic. Uh, and well, let me let me make one point. Let me make one oh, point on, on healthcare workers that we do yeah. just to add to what Kat said. We require our owners, our residents, to register uh, whoever uh, they claim to be their aid or healthcare provider, uh, so that we can track them and we can also ask them to fill out a questionnaire that we'll talk about in a slide or two. Uh, about their, you know, what they've been in contact with and have they had an exposure and things like that. Uh, but we, we just like any other visitor to the building, we want to know who they are because in normal times, they come and go as they please. They wave at the front desk and away they go without getting badged up to, uh, to a unit owner or residence uh, place. But in this situation, we've asked all of our people that have regular healthcare visits from aides or nurses or whatever, to provide us a list of the names and when they come and things like that. And that way we have it on in our computer registered as an authorized visitor. We get them the questionnaire and those kinds of things. And any that way any notices can go to the owner with a specific reference to, and please tell your caretaker that this is the new policy about X, Y, or Z. Perfect. Yeah, I think documentation and, and keeping track of those things is, is key. So that's great. And contractors especially. So going um, back to this topic, contractors, essential versus non-essential. So uh, Laura, how are these being handled? So all contractors, um, tradesmen, uh, engineers have been considered essential service providers under, you know, whether it's the state government, our, our governors, Safer at Home Order, or our local municipalities. What we have run into is, you know, owners who, you know, want to, owners who, whose plumbing, you know, fails and, and they need to have like a, a plumber come in versus the owner who wants to start their remodeling project. And so associations are having to balance um, essential contractors versus non-essential contractors. Um, the association's vendors, the landscaper, the plumber, the electrician, those are all considered essential contractors. Um, I have a client right now who has a unit owner who had completely gutted their kitchen right before the safe, basically before the coronavirus became an issue. They wanted to have you know, the association wanted to completely shut them down because they wanted to ban all contractors from coming into the building. But the, you know, the, the reverse argument was, well, they need a kitchen and plumbing and electricity to be able to eat, cook and eat food, um, you know, have running water. That was considered essential. So an essential contractor absolutely allowed um, non-essential, uh, you know, do I want to just redo the floors in my, in my condominium unit? Um, I think an association would be, while a contractor is considered an essential service provider, I do think that an association um, would be within its, um, 
uh, emergency powers and because it would be reasonable to limit, you know, construction projects that are considered non-essential. Um, basically that redoing of the floor. If they're going to allow contractors into the building, and, and I, this goes back to the client I was telling you about, not wanting to allow in the contractor to finish the construction on the kitchen, you know, we talked about requiring those contractors to wear personal protective equipment while they're in the building so that that would protect the common elements um, and the other residents if those contractors had been exposed or from any, just basically from those contractors, period. Um, so again, you know, from the association standpoint, and this really only applies to condominium associations as opposed to HOAs where um, somebody can have work done within their house. Um, if they can find the contractor to come out and do it, then they certainly could have that work done within their own single family home. Exactly. So Rick, has this come up at your community um, at all and, and how are the residents handling it? Uh, well, what Laura was talking about was a direct reference to the problem we had with a brand new owner who had bought his unit right before lease control started to be put in and had gutted his apartment. And we, I had a conversation with him as well as the general manager and uh, he, he promised us and told us that his contractor was prepared to commit to completing the work by the end of April, uh, that they had torn it all apart. Now they were just putting it back together again. And under the guidelines of essential uh, contracting services, we permitted that. Uh, but we also got his in writing uh, commitment that he would assure, he would ensure that the contractor obeyed all the rules of the landmark while they were on premise. And we, we thought that was a very important buy-in to get from him. As it turns out, it absolutely was because we put in the face mask rule this past weekend uh, for anybody on landmark property, period, has to wear a face mask. Uh, and yesterday, there were, he had six or seven of his workers not wearing face masks. So we not only called the owner, but uh, the, the first services general manager called uh, the company the president of the company and said, if you show up again and don't have face masks on and it gets reported to us, then you'll be asked to leave the site. Well, that's that hits them in their pocketbooks because they've already paid to get the guys there. So we saw immediate action and guys digging their face masks out of their toolboxes and what have you and, 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 and becoming compliant again. So I think that from the perspective of what Laura said, this these it's all absolutely you know, provided for in the, in the uh, uh, things from the governor and the county, uh, but you have to put in the management process as well. And general, uh, First Services has been, and I have been in strong agreement that this is no time to be kidding around with people or, or having half measures when it comes to enforcement. You have to specifically tell people that if you don't comply, you won't come on the site, or if you're already on the site, you'll be asked to leave the site. And I think that's really essential or else people will not have, see it as having any teeth and the owners will start letting them get away with it. So that's, that's, you know, it's a little, it's a little tough, but you know, we're talking about people's health. So we don't feel bad about it and we're going to continue to do it with the assistance of first service. Absolutely. Just, it seems like our residents are pretty understanding and compliant with it as well. Laura, you had something to add? I just wanted to add with our reference to face coverings. I know here in South Florida, I don't know what they've done in other states or in other parts of our state, but here in South Florida, Palm Beach, Miami-Dade, I know Hollywood, they, the governments have all as recently um, as probably April 10th enacted uh, uh, orders that require face coverings for every individual um, who is out in public where they can't um, maintain the six feet of uh, social distancing separation. So um, that is, you know, has become a, a rule, I guess, that all of us are re required to follow when we're outside of our homes is that face covering um, order. Yeah, this, that's is, this is one of those, it's one of those things where the, the political language was a little wishy-washy the health experts was pretty strong is what Laura said is that you wearing one is essential to your health. And uh, we, we see, we've seen just since Monday when it went into effect, I think it went into effect midnight Monday, Laura, 
uh, the 13th of uh, April, and uh, and you know it's it's uh, we've we've seen a growing number of people in our neighborhood wearing masks, uh, so I think it's people are taking it seriously, and we just have to reinforce it because when it becomes the new normal, people will start saying, well, I haven't heard about any cases in my neighborhood. I don't need to do this anymore. But I think from a perspective of group living like we have in condominiums, we need to pay attention to that pretty for, for some time to come. Absolutely. And uh, Kat, going back to the contractors, is there um, anything you wanted to add to that? Yes, in, in the high rise condominium setting, um, of course, they're all registered as they would normally be at the front desk in, in our system. Um, the key to having a successful implementation per the board's directives is communication. So we're very fortunate at First Service Residential, we have a very robust platform for communication, whether it be by text, email, or phone. Um, but we post these notifications, these rules everywhere, from the elevators to the restrooms to the mail rooms. Um, but with respect to the contractors, essential contractors are permitted in. Plumbers, right, an emergency electrician. Uh, Non-essential, however, they are not. But the essential contractors are still required to wear the PPE, personal protective equipment, which would be a face covering, and gloves, and that's for the protection of our residents, of course. We also um, may be permitted to ask a series of questions when they arrive, such as, have you tested positive for coronavirus? Have you been in contact with anyone who has tested positive? Have you recently traveled outside of the United States? Have you recently traveled to the four states that were listed um, as, uh, having to quarantine for a period of time if they came into the state of Florida. So we, we have been implementing all these different types of protocols. Uh, it has been effective and we have communicated this to all of the residents on a regular basis so everybody is aware. Yeah, I think that's a good point. Communication is, is the key here. Um, so very hot topic. The next uh, question I have for Laura, short-term rentals. Um, kind of define what short-term rentals are and, and how these are being uh, mitigated. So short-term rentals. Um, short-term rentals are defined under the Florida statutes as, as any rental for 30 days or less. Now, you all of you know that we could have an entire two-hour webinar on other issues that short-term rentals present, but in terms of coronavirus and COVID-19, um, here in Florida, our governor has enacted uh, an executive order prohibiting short-term rentals. Um, that means anything for less than 30 days. The governor has extended his order and that order currently is in effect through April the 30th of 2020. Um, and I guess we'll see at the end of the month if it gets extended again. But, you know, in a condominium setting, you know, a lot of times we always, or we like to have, um, you know, those rental durations. So we know for the most part in our condominiums what our rental restrictions are in terms of duration. In some condominiums, there's no set duration or limitation on what, you know, how long our rentals have to be. So in these condominiums, we have been, our clients have been presented with this issue of how do we stop our owners from renting their units out on a short-term basis? Um, my clients that don't have any, you know, rental restrictions um, with regard or limitations with regard to duration or allowed transient rentals have had to, to basically put in place a rule that says no short-term rentals at all um, are allowed. Now, whether they can stop an owner from actually, from, from violating the rule um, is to be determined, but if there's a check-in desk um, with the concierge or with the front desk where maybe keys are handed out, the, the association has completely put a stop to that. Um, in one condominium association, well, here in, in South Florida, um, in Palm Beach County, while there's an, a, a similar short-term rental restriction, 
um, there's an exception to that short-term rental where you can rent to healthcare providers or first responders. Well, the issue that that presents in a condominium association, as opposed to being in a single family home, uh, the issue that that presents is that you're bringing in, if you rent your unit out, um, your condominium unit out on a short-term basis to a healthcare provider, that is somebody who more likely than you know, just your average regular renter neighbor has been exposed to the coronavirus and COVID-19. And so that short-term renter is now bringing into the building where we have permanent residents, many of whom are over the age of 65. I'm here in Palm Beach County. Um, so that is a good um, segment of our population here. So they, you know, those short-term rentals um, if they're renting out to these healthcare providers, the potential for exposure of that virus to our full-time residents is great, great, great. So, um, you know, associations have been just prohibiting altogether, whether it's, you know, whether the person might fall under an exception or not um, in the condominium association setting. In a homeowner setting, I think that the exception, it, it works more in a homeowners association setting that allows short-term rentals um, because the potential for exposure to the other residents is not as great. Yeah, um, Kat, going along those lines, how are your communities um, enforcing uh, this policy? And uh, yeah, what are the differences between the condos and the HOAs? All right. Well, with respect to condominiums, they are having to, and when I say they, I mean front desk teams and management, are having to monitor very closely since this uh, order has uh, taken place. We have to be on the lookout for people coming in with suitcases who are not our residents. Um, and, and as Laura said, short-term rentals are, are sometimes an issue on a regular basis, but especially now because we are charged with enforcing this within the property. Um, there are code enforcement violations that will occur if this is not adhered to. Um, we can see code enforcement coming to a property if there is an infraction. Um, the order from the governor also included um, police fines and jail time, if I'm not mistaken, if Laura can correct me, but you know, it, it is to be taken very, very seriously and it jeopardizes the health and safety of the residents and so that's the primary reason behind this it puts everyone at risk if there is an influx of transient rentals right now and we're not trying to bring more risk to the to the residents who live there we're trying to abate that risk so we are monitoring very very closely and again communicating to the residents so they don't forget what the rules are absolutely yeah, one, one other thing on that short-term rentals, uh, they are punishable by fines. Violation of that executive order is punishable by fines um, and jail time. They are punishable as, I believe they're second degree misdemeanors. Um, and one of our local municipality, the police officer actually came to one of my associations that where they, they, are, they do allow transient rentals and said, if we hear about you know, any short-term rentals going on in this building you know we will be back and we will make arrests they're taking you know law enforcement is taking this uh issue very seriously yeah, when, I think that's that, really that, when that occurred when that occurred here um we i asked for services to reach out to the local police department and uh our normal contact there uh came back said you hit something we haven't had to do yet but if there's a violation of a quarantine or a uh, or a short-term rental, uh, we will come out and we will tell them that it's a misdemeanor. And then if we come back, then they'll be cited. So Palm Beach Garden's a little sleepy sometimes about these things, but they, they, they you're right, it's a misdemeanor, but they do come out and just provide the figure of authority, if you will, so that, uh, you know, we've told our staff that if somebody refuses to sign our paperwork and enters the building anyway that we're not to confront them we're to let the owner know and we're to call the police 
And that's, that's how we handle that so that we, we don't put uh, our, our employee between, or the first services employee between the resident and the person that wants access. And so the short-term rental thing falls right into that. And we just tell them, just, just call up the non-emergency number and say, I'd like an officer out here for somebody who refuses to obey our rules. And they'll send somebody out and, and, and handle it for us. Yeah, that's great to know that we have uh, local authorities that are supporting our communities. So fantastic example. Uh, so going along to the last uh, category here, when we're talking about access to the buildings um, or to the communities, uh, realtors or property caretakers, and these could be two separate categories, um, but kind of fall under one and the same. Uh, the caretakers might be checking on vacant units, but realtors showing uh, units and trying to stay in business in this time. Laura, uh, how are we handling these? So realtors this are another hot topic with a lot of my clients. Um, realtors are considered essential service providers. They um, are, you know, making property available and getting people homes. And that is um, one of the big initiatives is getting, you know, having people be able to stay in their homes. And so um, realtors are considered an essential service provider. However, in Palm Beach County, uh, our um, mayor has limited realtors to um, no um, uh, open houses, no open houses, and um, they can only do virtual or electronic work. Um, as long as they maintain social distancing, they can close on already pending transactions. But so the issue has become, you know, while the realtors are considered essential, are their uh, prospective purchasers and prospective renters considered essential? And my clients have taken the position, or I have taken the position with my clients, that the realtors are essential, but their guests are not. And so where the association has limited um, you know, guests and visitors, friends and family, um, or non-essential people to the building, um, those realtors should be able to do their job, but they need to go in, take video um, of the homes or photographs of the home so that they can then show um, these purchasing tenants or, or you know, whether they're gonna be purchasing or renting, um, I guess it doesn't matter, but we definitely, you know, the, the purpose is we don't want the realtors bringing third party outside non-essential people and walking all through the common areas of the building, showing them the, you know, all the amenities that are closed, um, but not, nonetheless, you know, showing them all over the building. Um, with respect to property caretakers who check on vacant units, they too are considered essential. Um, any property managers who, who this, what they're doing is checking on units for, um, owners who are, you know, don't reside in the units. These are people though, there's a distinction with property caretakers and a housekeeper. Property caretakers are those people who come into a unit to check on it. And if there is a problem, they are authorized to make the call to get the problem fixed. For instance, if they come in and they find that there's a water leak with the ice machine, they get that problem, they can get that problem fixed. The issue that's come up um, more recently this week is whether or not the housekeeper can be is considered that property caretaker and um, from my perspective the housekeeper is not considered the property caretaker because more than likely the lady the person sorry who comes in to clean the apartment is not going to be authorized to call the plumber if there's a leak Great. Yeah, I think that's really good advice. Rick, uh, how has your community been handling uh, realtors? Well, we have three or four, the top three or four people that sell in our building, uh, live in our building. Uh, and of course, they're balancing their health care, their health concerns with their, their business needs. Uh, Jeanette, our general manager, has spoken to them about virtual tours and things like that, and they're all doing that. Uh, we've not had any uh, 
we've not had any confrontations uh, where people, where realtors tried to come on site. We, we don't allow lock boxes and we don't allow open houses even before the, the county suggested that open houses were a bad idea. Um, and we have a requirement that the listing agent always must be with any other agent that brings people on property. So when you, when you have all those complications and you have the fact that the volume of, of lookers has dropped significantly, we haven't seen it as a problem, but we have discussed it and we do have uh, processes in place to deal with realtors. Caretakers, uh, in, in, in the case of caretakers, I believe that uh, our first service policy is to escort the caretaker to the apartment and to, you know, to, to see what's what, and then, and then they're escorted off the property. So I think we're pretty much in sync with what Laura's advising in that regard. And, uh, uh, and, and of course, first service has a protocol for handling it. And, uh, when we, when we talk about it, either a board member wants to know about it or, or I do or whatever, uh, first service is right on top of their procedures and follows them. So that's, that's pretty much what you have to make sure is that you understand what the policies are and the protocols are, and then just ask for the, your general manager to report on them if there's a problem. Great. And uh, Kat, how is this being enforced on, on the properties and what are you seeing? In the high rise condominiums, um, we have not seen a lot of realtors. Um, we do have realtors as residents, uh, like Rick said. Um, there's a lot of goodwill there. They understand um, how the residents feel because they are a resident. Um, there are a lot of virtual open houses going on, you know, that's always been available uh, online. So there's a lot of that. Um, property caretakers, if there is a leak in a unit, we need that property caretaker to be there. But again, we know when they're coming and going. We have put them into our system. We ask them to wear a face covering and some gloves, and we escort them back and forth. And of course, if there is anything they see in the unit, maintenance our maintenance team will follow up immediately and see if it's affecting any other unit or the common areas great so i think that covers all the access um, to the the property and, and the different categories that we've defined but uh rick had alluded to this earlier um you know asking a series of questions to visitors uh what types of questions are we able to ask laura and are we able to take temperatures before granting access good questions um asking you know yes the the association can ask visitors a series of questions before granting access uh, regarding temperature taking, I'll get into that in a little bit. However, um, the types of questions that the association can ask before allowing access are the ones that Rick mentioned before. Have you been to um, another country? Have you traveled to another country? Here in Florida, our governor has put into place um, an order requiring visitors who've come from the New York tri state area and Louisiana to self-quarantine for 14 days. So asking a visitor if they've been to the New York tri-state area or Louisiana, asking them if they've been in contact with another uh, person who has contracted COVID-19. Those are the types of questions that the association can ask visitors. The, with regard to taking temperature, and I know that a lot of associations want to be able to take temperature, However, that has a lot of implications that associations need to consider. Um, one of them being that there are several government websites that, that I've looked to or that, that consider taking temperature a medical examination. I don't think that we want our community associations to get into the business of providing medical examinations. Um, because then that comes with a whole other host of issues such as privacy concerns. Um, but, you know, this whole COVID-19 coronavirus pandemic is very fluid. And, you know, our, you know, there are orders going into effect every couple of days and there's new rules and new recommendations. 
and we don't know what um, you know next week is going to hold with regard to what we you know recommend or don't recommend. Um, I think just um, as recently as it was April 14, 13, 14, um, the governor of California was saying, you know, the new normal in the future is going to be everybody uh, wearing a face covering when they go out to eat or restaurants taking temperatures. So right now, um, with regard to access in uh, to a condominium association, I don't think this really applies to a homeowners association, but in a condominium association, um, Taking temperature has a lot of, of just other issues that go along with it with regard to, to privacy. Um, and I would refer those condominium associations to speak with their legal counsel if that's something that they are considering. But not to say that things won't change you know, next week or in the next couple of weeks with regard to, to taking temperature. Um, and certainly if, if they were going to take temperature, um, my recommendation would be that um, one, I have the permission of the person I'm taking, whose temperature I'm taking, and two, I get them to sign um, a waiver, uh, uh, you know, or, or a release or hold harmless as to the association. Um, and again, and one last thing with regard to taking temperature um, and how I, I know I've counseled my clients, um, Taking the temperature doesn't necessarily tell us if someone has the COVID-19 coronavirus. Um, they could have something else that is not the coronavirus, right, if they have a temperature. And we also know that coronavirus um, doesn't necessarily, you know, somebody can have it and not have any of the side effects. So even if we're taking a temperature, we might be taking a temperature of somebody who doesn't have a temperature but is carrying the COVID-19 disease. So the, the temperature um, question has a lot of, again, a lot of implications. There are a lot of issues and things to consider with, the, with um, taking somebody's temperature. But again, things could change in the coming weeks. Absolutely. Yeah, those are really great points um, about, you know, not knowing if it's Corona or something else or, or you know, non-symptomatic. So, uh, Rick, I know you've implemented uh, a series of questions at your community. Do you want to talk a little bit about that? Sure. We've designed the questions uh, after the CDC recommended questions and a number of other sources, and we reviewed them with Laura Manning uh, before we implemented them to make sure that we were citing things correctly and what have you. But mostly those are related with they're related to where have you been and who have you been in contact with? You know, have you been in contact with anybody that's been diagnosed with the virus? Have you been to New York, Louisiana, New Jersey, Connecticut, whatever? Uh, have you worked any place where they have notified you that they've been exposed to the virus and you might be exposed also? Questions like that. And they're all pretty straightforward. What we did in terms of our insurance, which you mentioned before, is we checked. Uh, with our insurance carrier about our actions on, on managing exposure to this virus uh, of our building and our people. And it's one thing that uh, uh, other buildings ought to do if they haven't already is, is there a virus exempt, exemption in the insurance policies, either in your uh, directors and officers liability policy or in your your general liability policy. And we, we happen to be um, in a category where we don't have any exceptions based on a virus or any kind of illness type of thing. So we're, we're being careful with our liability issues and making our decisions on what questions we ask and what we do. Uh, but we, we, we don't see that our insurance has any exceptions that could cause us a liability exposure. Taking temperatures, I'm, you know, Laura and I are finally coming closer together on this. We have decided as a board to do this, but we have held off implementing it. And part of the reason is we're not ready. We don't have a protocol and we have agreement from one of our contractors to do this. We have, and his lawyers and insurance people have cleared it for him, but we don't have the equipment. We don't have a logging methodology. We don't have a security methodology of, of keeping that information confidential uh, yet. 
And uh, quite frankly, until we do, uh, we wouldn't implement that just as a, a, a ad hoc process. I'm of the opinion, and again, this is just my opinion, that everything that I read says that it may become the coin of the realm. And that is, is that your temperature is taken in a number of places where you go. And it's going to be taken like in Japan and the Far East in airports where they have cameras that take your temperature and can spot people that are infected as they walk through an airport or a train station or in a, in a busy area of a downtown area. I, I think that this is, um, this is, might be a part of the new normal as, as Laura has suggested. And uh, quite frankly, if they decide that, you know, if you, if you take a hundred people's temperature and, you know, if you look at the stats, um, some percentage of that will, might have the virus but be asymptomatic. But if you catch somebody with a hundred, hundred point four or higher temperature, uh, they, they, that may be their symptom and you, you, you know, they may be infectious about a number of things like Laura said, but the one we're worried about is the most rapidly spreading disease in my lifetime. And that is the, uh, coronavirus. So we're kind of, we're planning and that's what I think all these things on a long-term basis associations have to do is plan and consider all the risks and, and the legal considerations and the liability considerations and what have you, and also protecting people's privacy. Absolutely. Um, and going to our next question, I'm gonna uh, go over to Kat on this one, talking about move-ins and move-outs. Um, are these being permitted in your communities right now and, and how are you handling these? And the short answer to that would be yes. So apart from a homeowners association where the logistics are quite different operationally, moving van comes into the community, it's not necessarily in contact with anyone other than perhaps the, the guard gatehouse. Um, and then it goes directly to a home. There's much more contact and interaction in a condominium setting. So move-ins and move-outs are being permitted. Why is that? Because we don't want to see people displaced with nowhere to go. There very well could have been a move planned for months before uh, the COVID-19 crisis of the pandemic came about in our lives. So these people need to go somewhere, they need to move in, and likewise the person needs to move out. However, policies and procedures are in place. Of course they're being registered. Questions are being asked upon their arrival, as Laura and Rick were mentioning. We, we can ask those vital, critical questions. Um, we do clean up after them. We follow them through the building with our janitorial team and clean where they have touched and moved, elevator buttons. Perhaps a valet cart was used. We have to make sure that we're aware of that. We have receptacles in the parking garages and near the contractor ramps for them to dispose of their gloves. We don't want to see those on the floor and then someone picks that up outside. So we're thinking ahead. We're making sure that we have procedures in place. Again, we've already consulted with council to make sure what we're doing is legal. We're staying abreast of the ever-changing protocols. Um, we're always making sure that these companies that are moving people in and out are not only wearing their PPE, face covering and gloves, but also that they're always licensed, insured, and we have proof of that on site. Great, yeah, I think that's incredibly important. And Laura, are there any legalities associated with this? So a couple of things. I know, at least here in Palm Beach County, um, uh, movers are considered an essential service. I don't know that they're listed on any other lists. Um, I haven't looked at you know, every municipality, but, but certainly here in Palm Beach County, they're considered an essential service. One thing I think that associations who are trying to prohibit move-ins and move-outs need to consider is that there's some potential liability there for an association who doesn't want to let an, a new owner move into their condominium unit or a tenant move into their new unit that they've just rented. And I'm talking in terms of um, inter tortious interference with a contract. You know, if you're interfering with a landlord and tenant's legally binding lease agreement, 
by not letting them move into the unit, that could be considered tortious interference with that contract. Um, if you're not allowing a, a resident, a, a new owner or just an owner to move into their condominium unit and you're precluding them, that you're basically precluding them from access to their property, their own property, I think that also raises uh, some liability issues for associations. So not only, um, you know, do I recommend consulting with your legal counsel on this issue if it comes up and, and you know, your board is inclined to not allow it, you may want to also ask your insurance agent if there's any liability issue um, with that. And for, for any of these access control restrictions, um, I've, you know, I've, I've recommended a lot of, you know, why don't you go ask your insurance agent because I get a lot of pushback you know, when I tell somebody either there's liability or there's no liability, liability, you know, again, all of these things are so new. So I have, you know, deferred or referred a lot of clients over to insurance agents to run some of these issues by them. And um, I will tell you that we've been pretty consistent with the insurance agents. That's great. And uh, Rick, was there anything else you wanted to add on your end? Sure. Um do what you can um, as an association to expedite the mover's time on presence on premise. Uh, they, you know, continuous contact is one of the things that the experts talk about can be a real hazard. If you walk by somebody that has the virus, there's little chance that you're gonna that you're gonna get the virus just by walking past. But if you have somebody that's on site all day long, a crew of five or six people uh, that are working to move somebody in or somebody out. Uh, there's there are going to be a lot of contact. So we we have a nor in normal times have a policy of of either you 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 pay a, a reduced fee and you wait for an elevator. We don't have great elevators in our building or any of our buildings. Uh, or but we've changed that now that people pay for dedicated use of an elevator and that greatly speeds up the move in move out process. You don't have two or three guys hanging in the lobby on the ground floor and hanging in the lobby on the destination floor, uh, waiting for elevators to, to be freed up from normal passenger traffic. So I would suggest that. The second thing is the um, follow, follow behind, as Kat said, on cleanup. Uh, we, we do that as a matter of course anyway, because we're, we make our, our resident uh, liable for any damage that his moving company uh, might cause. So we're doing an inspection immediately after uh, the move is finished, and, and now we're just adding cleanup to that as well. And then thirdly, remember, these guys have a, have, have a survival mode. A lot of, there's not a lot of move-ins, move-outs going on right now, and they're willing to do almost anything you ask in terms of preventing any of their people from infecting the building or infecting uh, a resident. So if you ask them to wear gloves and a mask and a, and a beanie with a propeller on top, they're going to do it. And, 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 and if, you know, if they don't, if their workers don't do it, one quick call should get that changed very quickly. And I think that's one of the places where you need to enforce things um, and check on people regularly throughout the course of a day while the move is happening. Great. And um, Kat, if you want to give a brief overview of what we discussed today, just about uh, restricting access controls and some of the things we discussed. I would say uh, to the boards of directors who are watching this webinar, to our, our, our clients, and of course our teams, anybody out there should revisit their temporary policies and procedures every 30 days. Stay in tune with the municipal and governmental orders. Continue to follow CDC guidelines. Partner with your management team. Uh, and your association council, association insurance agent, everybody come together for the good of the residents, whether it be a homeowners association, whether it be a, a condominium, garden style, mid-rise, doesn't matter. The key is communication, still following the laws, right? So if your board is going to implement rules, still notice a board meeting, even if they're invoking emergency procedures but communicate, communicate, communicate. And that would be probably the key to success because residents by large do not 
break the rules, quote unquote, on purpose, a lot of times they're not aware and it's hard right now to keep up with everything going on. So that is very important. Um, but I would say to definitely revisit the current pro pro protocols in place. Great. And just to piggyback on a point that uh, Rick and Laura made earlier, you know, it seems like we're, this is a short-term problem, but there's long-term implications. So I think just considering that um, when we're establishing these policies and going forward. Uh, that's all the time that we have for today. So thank you all. This information was tremendously valuable uh, to the board members that we serve. Uh, I have a few resources up on the screen here, including an email where you can send additional questions um, that we might not have covered today. But thank you all for participating in our webinar. Uh, please keep an eye out for more information on upcoming webinars. Uh, we believe this COVID-19 Your Questions Answered webinar series will provide valuable insight uh, that you and your fellow board members can put into action in your communities. And I think I speak for everyone uh, on this panel when I say that it's times like these that demonstrate the importance of what you all do as board members. So thank you all for your leadership in your communities uh, and for all of our clients. Thank you for allowing us to serve you and our residents at this time uh, during a very difficult time. So you and your families be well and thank you again. Thank you. Thank you.